You're listening to something else, your weekly dose of alternative arts and culture. My name's Maren and I'm back with another film and video edition of Something Else. And today we'll be talking to Lauren Tico Bayless. How are you going today? Yeah, good. Thanks for inviting me on, guys. You're welcome. Um, thanks for coming. So Antenna is showing films from 18 countries over the next four days. So one of these films is Life in Vitro, whose director um, joins me in the studio now. So um, Lauren, do you want to give us a, a short rundown about um, what Life in Vitro is about? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, primarily, it's a film about hope and last chances, uh, but also about the IVF process. So um, we kind of focused more on the psychological and emotional effects of the IVF treatment rather than the actual medical process of it all. And we tried not to get too bogged down with politics as well. (laughs) That's always a good thing. Um, So um, the couple's name was Hedda and Craig, right? That's right, How did you get to know them? I've known Craig for years, and uh, Hedda I actually met on the first trip to the IVF clinic. How did they approach you about... Um, becoming a donor? Know, becoming a donor. Um, I hadn't seen Craig actually in about a year or so, and he dropped by for a cup of tea and um, to drop a big question onto me about whether or not I'd become a donor for them. Uh, it didn't take me too long to decide, actually. It was um, a pretty powerful question, I suppose, and I felt really honoured to be asked by them. Yeah, it's... it's quite a um, generous and um, selfless gift to give someone, isn't it? And very personal. Um, are you normally good at choosing presents? Or? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I suppose so. I, um, I, yeah, it is a present. I suppose that's how you, we had to look at it um, in the end. So we didn't, I didn't come to attach to the idea of there being a child out there with um, half my DNA. But... Uh, yeah, it was um, it's quite an emotional trip. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, would have been pretty um, intense. So the, the documentary is very personal. You, you direct it and you're one of the three main characters. That's right, yeah. Um, so uh, how did you approach that as a, as a filmmaker? Um, you pretty much had to throw objectivity out the window. Uh, actually, objectivity <laughs> is what saved me in the long run, like being able to try and separate myself from what was happening because it was such an intense thing that um, sometimes it was just healthy to take a back seat to what was happening at the time and just take the edge off how intense it was by going, all right, now who do we have to interview? How am I going to get the camera gear there? Um, all right, it's time for me to sit down and talk to the camera now about what's going on in my day. It just really helped me process it all, I suppose. Oh. Um, do you think that the camera changed the events that occurred? Do you think that it had an impact? Like, did it become a part of the experience? We were itself? filming every day for months upon months, so really it became background after a while. Um, the first couple of interviews were a bit um, camera aware, I suppose, and same with me talking just one on one to the camera. It was um, we didn't use very many of those. It was quite awkward, but uh, you become very relaxed. You actually treat the camera a bit like your friend I suppose that you can unload everything to. Oh. And so um, what about the actual um, donation and, and how your family and friends reacted to that and um, your girlfriend as well how did that go down when you suggested it? Um, I had a uh, my mum didn't really like the idea of what I was doing but she supported me nonetheless my girlfriend didn't like the idea of what I was doing and she didn't really want to support me through the act of it either so that was pretty hard to um juggle the two things but uh yeah I suppose in the end it helped me grow up a lot and see you know what was happening around me and who was my friends and who was really my friends. Do you think that you learned a lot about yourself then or (laughs) about other people? I learned shit loads about myself (laughs) and other people absolutely it was one of the biggest growing experiences of my life um, as a filmmaker as well as um, as an egg donor. How did you um, approach it morally then because it is kind of um, yeah a very personal and uh, in some ways controversial kind of issue. Did you meet it head on or did you kind of just I actually, I was um, always working on the back foot with filming. Um, I was first and foremost an egg donor and then I was a um, filmmaker. Uh, I wasn't initially going to film any of the um, the news that they got or I was going to keep it quite orientated on my story and what I had to go through, but they were the ones that insisted and said, no, we want to share our story as well. So it was good. Um, Yeah, in the end, they were the ones that were insisting upon me being there for 
all of the good and the bad. So were your expectations um, fulfilled? Like as a documentary maker, you must have had some kind of idea about um, the film that you were going to make. Were those expectations fulfilled or um, was it just more the camera was there to watch whatever like story took place? Well, uh, the story that we wanted to capture at the very beginning was um, what it was like as an egg donor because I wanted a bit of information when I was trying to make up my decision and... Um, I couldn't find too many stories out there from um, from the egg donor's perspective, so I wanted to make something informative and not preach about how it is, but just show, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Yeah, it is interesting, uh, especially from the egg donor's perspective, that um, which is something that um, maybe a lot of couples might try to avoid thinking about too much because it's um, such, a, such a big ask that they wouldn't want to... Um, I don't know, get bogged down in, in maybe the the downsides for someone else's, like, psychologically or whatever. Um, yeah, how did, did how did Heather and Craig deal, like, how did they relate to you then? Um, we had a lot of counselling that was kind of put upon us by IVF. There was months of it before any of us could actually make the decision of what was going to happen. Um, yeah, they... My counsellor actually said that I was too young and also the fact that I didn't have a family of my own it, because of the complications that could possibly happen. Um, it was a bit of a dangerous move, I suppose. And um, Is this like physical complications? Yeah, physical occur? complications, yeah. Like what? Um, or oh, <laughs> uh, like uh, you're because you're taking steroids and injecting them straight into your um, stomach, basically. Um, you can take too many of them, and they can your, the ovaries can twist over upon themselves and break off. So oh. that sounds very painful, it and does, um, it would cause really. hospitalisation, and in some cases, infertility. Oh yeah. So <laughs> there was. Uh, I want to have kids one day myself. So it was a big kind of question to ask myself whether or not I was prepared to help these guys out and jeopardise my own future. Yeah, so it's a pretty big move. <laughs> was there anything that you didn't film in this um, documentary or did you ever have a moment where you realised you had to turn the camera off? Oh, that's <laughs> a tricky question. Um, there's a reason why we left it out. Um, yeah, there was some big news that we found out in the middle of it. Um, it's hard for me to explain to you there without <laughs> giving away too much of the film, but um, I had to definitely draw a line between what I was prepared to do for this film and um, what I was going to leave out. I suppose if I had a producer attached um, at the time of filming, it definitely would have been shot, but um, I decided to be the egg donor instead of the um, investigative you know, journalist. Uh, that, I think that's probably a decision that you can at least sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, interesting in documentary when, when things get more personal, which I think documentaries for the past decade or more have really been a lot more about um, acknowledging bias and about, yeah, about acknowledging your role in events that took place. But um, you're pretty confident then that you would have done it all the same even if there wasn't a camera involved? Yeah, I am actually. Um, and I am proud about that fact, that I would have done it the same either way. Um, you know, just throwing throwing yourself in the camera's way so that you could, um, yeah, make a good documentary. You, you thought that you'd do it one way or the other. Yeah, no, exactly right. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good thing to know. And um, Heather and Craig then didn't, didn't seem to mind at all that um, they were being filmed? Um, yeah, in the beginning they were a bit um, nervous, I suppose, about maybe my what, how much I was going to show of their lives and um, when they realised they had really nothing to hide they, um, they came right out and they were um, they were loving talking to the camera they were really wanting <laughs> to like let other donors know this is what it's like and um, yeah you didn't read this in the pamphlet so we're going to tell you oh, so um, you wouldn't be scared of showing it to someone else before they went through the same thing no I wouldn't um, I've actually had people tell me that they've watched it, this is in the test screenings and stuff, saying I've made up my mind now about whether or not I'd ever do it. And a couple of them said they wouldn't do it after having watched it, which is, um, I suppose, you know, I'm not there to, to sell the idea of IVF. I'm just there to tell you a story and what it's like. Yeah. And it, maybe it's good that they, they found out before the fact. Yeah, sure. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, so, what what kind of um, support was available to you then from uh, from IVF? They, you had counsellors, but then also from your family and friends, if they weren't like that keen on it. <laughs> oh, everyone had their opinion, and it was really interesting to hear. I didn't actually include a lot of the interviews that I did with my family and friends, um, but yeah, everyone was pretty decided. It was kind of my health first that they were concerned about, and then secondly had I really considered what it would be like to have a kid or well, not like not actually have a kid but have a kid <laughs> it's something um that women never really have to think about normally and um I guess especially I think sperm sperm donors have it a bit easier in many ways don't they but um <laughs> yeah it is pretty fascinating to um have to be able to make that decision and think about the impact especially on a whole another new human life yeah exactly right especially I can imagine for your mum uh, that she'd have a grandchild I guess if that's what the way that she thinks about it oh well she had to come into one of the counseling sessions with me just so that they they knew I suppose because I was um 24 when it all started um and they said what would you feel like being a grandmother and she's like I don't view it like that like Lauren's giving a gift and um it's it's not her child. It was part of her that helped create it, and um, you know, it's. I don't think she can claim ownership over it, and I definitely can't claim ownership over it. That's what my mum was saying. So it's a good attitude to have it's about a great it. Great attitude to have. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise it, get, it would get pretty tricky. <laughs> no, you don't need possessive fourth and fifth parties involved with the process. Just no parenting. Parenting's tricky enough with two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Um, yeah, so are you glad that you had this experience then? Um, do you have any, any regrets or anything that you would have done differently? Um, anything that I would have done differently? I No, I don't think so. I, um, I probably would have filmed more. Um, just Although we had the camera on every day, there were some times when you just could not be bothered to lug it to the surgery, like to the clinic again and set up for another couple of shots. And, I mean, I was learning... Um, I come from a production producer background, so filming was pretty new to me, um, the actual filming of it all. And uh, I think that I could have been a little less lazy with the amount of shots that I got <laughs> and things like that. But you get pretty tired. The, um, the fatigue of all of the hormones and drugs that I was yeah. on was pretty hard to deal as well with filming yeah cool so um have you got more documentaries in the works or any other kind of um creative projects uh yeah we've got another one coming up it's on piracy um looking at it across the music industry as well as film and kind of gauging people's moral compass about that that sort of thing and you know is it right what are you actually taking and oh, cool. what's the solution to it all oh Interesting. All right. And um, so Life in Vitro is screening this Sunday at 4.30 yep. at the Chevelle. And um, also um, don't forget there's lots of more, um, more, more and more documentaries to catch from 18 countries. Did you say 42? 42, 42 altogether, yeah. 42 documentaries from 18 countries. And there's um, 15 Australian premieres. And it opened just last night. So how, how was the opening um, it was great. Well, like the rest of the films are going to be at the Chevelle, but this one was down at the um, the Keys. Um, it was beautiful, beautiful night for it. Lots oh, of nice. people. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it must be really exciting to get to know all the other filmmakers and uh, so, everyone else. And it's also really <laughs> strange having media people come up and say, "Can I take your photo?" I've never had that before. <laughs> it's bizarre. <laughs> uh, the life of a celebrity already. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much for coming in and talking to us, Lauren. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'd just like to quickly say uh, thanks to Motion Picture Militia and my business partner and brilliant editor Hayden Topperween for helping me through all this, as well as Rami Fischler from Media Farm.